so I did. And then I, all I heard was, oh, my God. And Because I, I could feel my hands getting warm from the blood. He's won two Cy Young Awards and has been an anchor on the best pitching staff in Major League Baseball. But now Tom Glavin is struggling to recapture the glory before time runs out. All good things come to an end. I mean, that, that's, that's a fact. Um, you know, you look back and you see the opportunities we've had and you wonder, again, the, the law of average is how many more chances is, is this club going to get to get a championship. One unsettling but seemingly accepted practice in baseball is the bean ball. When a pitcher intentionally hits a batter is a message of intimidation that often sparks a bench-clearing brawl. What happened, though, in a recent college baseball game went over the edge? Wichita, Kansas, the nation's heartland. The sport of choice here is baseball, the college variety. The national pastime without the lockouts and inflated salaries. Everything good about the game until a Friday evening in late April. It's one of the most vicious acts that I have ever seen. An inch this way or an inch this way, I could have died. The University of Evansville was opening a three-game series against Wichita State. As Wichita's starting pitcher took his final warm-up throws, junior infielder Anthony Molina walked from his on-deck circle behind the catcher to the opponent's side of the field, approximately 15 to 24 feet from home plate. On the mound for the Shockers was their 21-1 ace, Ben Christensen. And I'm watching him, and I, he, he gets into his lineup, and all of a sudden, he opens up to his left like a quarter of a turn because Anthony was way to his left. He wasn't even behind. And he rifled a pitch as hard as he could right at Anthony. I just looked up. And in about a split second, I got hit in the eye. I mean, I, I, for a second, I wondered what hit me. And then I was like, well, why would a baseball hit me? And then I knew. It was pretty loud. Uh, I heard the, the helmet crash. And I looked up, and I saw him on the ground. And I was, I was kind of shocked they hit him in the head. They asked me if I could sit up, and I said, yeah. So I said, take, my, take your hands away from your eyes. So I did. And then they, all I heard was, oh, my god. And Because I could feel my hands getting warm from the blood. Molina suffered a blowout fracture around the eye socket and a gash above his left eye that required 23 stitches to close. He has two blind spots in his left eye, and doctors aren't certain that vision in the eye will ever improve beyond its present 20-125. For a while, he was cautioned not to even sneeze for fear the pressure might further damage the eye. It was a 92-mile-an-hour fastball, so yeah, it's, it's going to hurt. I asked the pl plastic surgeon, he said, well, I said, what's the equivalent? He said, it's... It's like getting hit in the head with a sledgehammer. Christensen was immediately ejected and later suspended for the rest of the season. What would prompt an honor student who's a certain pick in next month's Major League draft to commit such a bizarre act? Ben told the Missouri Valley Conference Executive Committee that he wanted to send a warning to Anthony that he was too close, that he was, he thought, uh, test timing his, uh, his pitches, so he threw a brushback pitch. A statement Ben Christensen submitted through his attorneys to the Missouri Valley Executive Committee on May 7th reads, Ben followed the unwritten rule he'd been taught by coach Brent Chemnitz. If the on-deck hitter is standing too close to home plate, you brush him back. Chemnitz, his pitching coach, admitted in his own statement to the committee, I teach our players that if an on-deck batter is out of the on-deck circle and standing in close proximity to home plate, attempting to gain an advantage, steps should be taken to move the player. The last option is for the pitcher to throw in the general vicinity of the on-deck batter to communicate that his conduct is inappropriate and not appreciated. Chemnitz was suspended for the remaining 14 regular season games and any possible postseason matchups with Evansville. On the advice of his lawyer, Chemnitz would not speak on camera, but gave us a copy of a letter he had sent the Missouri Valley Conference stating, I did not see the pitch when it was thrown, nor did I call for it or have any prior knowledge of it. My deepest sympathies go out to the Molina family, and I am truly sorry this occurred. This was a, uh, a terrible, terrible thing, and it should never have happened. And uh, everyone concerned is deeply sorry about it. While nobody on the Wichita State team condones what happened to Molina, it's clear how they have been taught to play the game. We're taught to not be afraid, you know, not be afraid of batters. 
sometimes you brush people back, but, you know, that keeps them off balance. And that's, you know, what they're taught to do. It's just, you know, just make sure that the guy's not up there timing their pitches, you know, so they get an unfair advantage or what have you, and that's what we've done here. I don't want to be part of baseball if, if that's the practice. Um, I don't, I, you wouldn't do that to a human being on the street, let alone before the game even starts. Thanks. I mean, there, I, I don't know how you would explain it, and nobody has to me yet. Christensen did speak to CNN Sports Illustrated with his lawyer present and with the understanding that he would only be asked about how he felt when he hit Molina and how he feels now. Kind of shocked me that the ball hit him. Um, you know, I tried to, after it hit him, I was a little stunned and I kind of tried to go towards him, you know, to see if he was all right. But the uh, first base umpire stopped me, sent me to my dugout. And, you know, I saw it hit his hit him in the face and so you know it kind of I was a little scared um, just to think that you know that was me that I hurt somebody it wasn't intentional and it, it kind of makes me feel bad to think that they think it was I believe he did it on purpose that he threw the ball at me on purpose now whether his intent was to injure me I I mean it could have it could have been just to hit me in the arm and to get me to run out there you know, I mean, but still, it was, it was intentional. I'd like to apologize to him. I mean, it's not the same over the camera, but if he is watching, you know, I'd like to have him know that I am sorry for what's happened to him. And, you know, I didn't mean it, no matter what he thinks. My reaction to that is, if, if he wanted to apologize, he could have came to the hospital that night. He could, I mean, he didn't even come to see how I was. He didn't even come to see if I was okay, laying on the ground. The wounds remain deep for both sides. A once amicable relationship between the two programs has been destroyed. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of anger in Evansville. I think the, as much anger uh, exists because of the, the, these fans and their reaction. I knew that that guy wasn't in the right place. He should have been over there. And he is the victim, which I don't believe is the victim. You lose respect in a hurry for a program like this. It's just disgusting what's happened here. If I'd have read the same thing, if I'd heard the same thing in another school, I would have said, that could never happen at Wichita State. It could never happen at Wichita State. We have too many safeguards. It could never happen. I've been going to my brother's games lately, and I've been watching them, and I see kids playing and they just they don't look like they want to play and I say well it, you know at least at least they can play at least they have the chance to and for someone to like Christensen he gets he gets to get drafted you know I mean he gets to go to the, the major leagues and I I don't know if I ever get to play again does it scare you it scares me I mean this is what I've been since I was eight years old I wanted to do this, so. So you think about it every day, I'm sure. Yeah, I do. When I, I watch baseball games, I mean that's 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 what I get. That's what I get to do. You know, I get to watch. The physical aftermath is well documented, but what many people don't know is the pain and fear went much deeper than any physical injury could inflict. Before I went to college, over that summer. As I was riding to the hospital, that's that's the same thing I thought. Is this gonna happen to me? You know, doctors say something that's genetic. I mean, is is this gonna happen to me? Am I gonna, you know? So. So a whole flood of emotions is probably going through you, not just the pitch and not just I'm hurt. Yeah, not not just, you know. Gee, I'm never gonna play baseball again. It's like, 
you know, I, I, I could have, I could not be here, you know. I could not be here today talking to you. Anthony Molina has hired an attorney and is expected to file a civil suit against Ben Christensen. The NCAA baseball tournament, meanwhile, got underway yesterday. Wichita State is ranked seventh and defeated Oral Roberts 13 to five. Coming up next on page one, Cy Young winner Tom Glavin of the Atlanta Braves has always used golf as a refuge. But after a messy public divorce, the ballpark has become another sanctuary. I don't care what it is. If you've got something on your mind 24 hours a day, it's going to grind at you and it's going to eat you. And, and, and somewhere along the line, you have to have an outlet from it. Uh, and for me, I guess, like I said, I decided early on that that was going to be the ballpark. Now, as he does each week, Jim Huber joins us, this time with the story of a two-time Cy Young Award winner in search of a lost groove. Nick, ironically, the last time Tom Glavin started a season 0-3 was his rookie year, and it must have seemed to him like the start of a horror story. In fact, it began one of the most remarkable stretches in baseball history. Is that coming to an end now? It surely must be the most daunting experience in all of your professional life. To stand on a little pile of dirt surrounded by 50,000 screaming people trying to find yourself. You can't back out. You can't call for help. Somehow, some way, you either bury yourself or find some answers. Tom Glavin knows the feeling. There's nowhere to hide. And you're out there and you feel absolutely alone. And it's, you know, you against the world out there. And, and you don't feel so good about your chances. I mean, I, I can sit here and tell you that there have been innings that I've been out there pitching just not real sure about what I'm doing. Even after 13 years in the majors, all with the Atlanta Braves, even after nearly a decade as the foundation of a staff called one of the best in baseball history, he still faces his own worst enemy, himself. But in the past, he has managed to overcome his insecurities. However, this year, compared to the last five seasons, his earned run average is up nearly two and a half runs, and opponents are hitting better than 300 against him. It's a reality check because you just don't know, um, you know, from one day to the next whether something like that is going to sideline your career or an injury is going to sideline your career, and that's why you have to take it, uh, you know, a day at a time, really, and appreciate what you have. In the 90s, nothing besides death and taxes have been more reliable than the Braves' starting pitching. Glavin first, then John Smoltz, Steve Avery for a while, Greg Maddox, Denny Nagel, a staff that won six Cy Young Awards. 757 games and seven straight division championships from 1991 through 1998. But Glavin recalls years that more resemble death and taxes. When I got here in the late 80s, you know, we, we were trying not to lose 100 games a year. That was our goal. It wasn't about winning. Uh, it was, you know, let's, let's try not to win, lose 100 games this year. And, and, you know, you're out of the pennant race by Memorial Day. A decade later, though, the Braves have somehow maintained their hold on first place in the division. That pitching staff has struggled. Glavin lost his first three games for the first time since his rookie season. Maddox has earned run average is higher than at any other time since 1987. Smoltz went on the disabled list. And Glavin's worst nightmares seem to be coming true. The odds are that, you know, sooner or later this run is going to end. Uh, both for the team and, and for me personally. I mean, everything, all good things come to an end. I mean, that, that's, that's a fact. And so he goes deep inside himself or deep inside right, well, his spacious home in suburban Atlanta. A scratch golfer, he will take up his putter, lock himself in this remarkable room, and get far, far away. If you don't get the right speed, it breaks a lot more. There it is. Wow, second try. How do you like that? Glavin is now happily married again, a devoted father, but his divorce from his first wife was an ugly public journey take that to the mound every fourth or fifth night with all eyes watching, wondering. You know, I guess I, the way I, I looked at, at my problems off the field was, you know, I'm going to deal with this 22 hours out of the day. I might as well take, you know, two to four hours during the day when I'm at the ballpark and just kind of get it off my mind. I mean, I don't care what it is. That was kind of my, uh, my hiding place from everything. That bit of personal advice is one of the few that Glavin didn't share in his new soft cover book called Baseball for Everybody. And there are no answers in there for what he's gone through the first quarter of this season either. I haven't looked in there yet. That'll probably be my, my last resort. Until then, he will continue to climb that pile of dirt as he has 374 times in his career, knowing the arms on the staff around him remain solid. 
knowing the club behind him remains impressive, trying to convince himself that an era doesn't necessarily have to end with a millennium. To prove that these are still games just played by big boys, Tom lists in his book his five favorite career games. One of them, of course, was the game that he pitched the Braves to the 1995 World Championship. The other, a game his junior year in high school, Nick. Glavin will be back on the mound tonight in Atlanta when he takes on Carlos Perez and the Los Angeles Dodgers.